I mean, I've cried a lot this week. And also in our interview, I love that like several times I'm like, oh no, am I going to cry? Oh no, <laughs> am I going to cry? Well, guys, here we are. It's me, Busy Phillips. Feels like it was just yesterday that we were talking, and it wasn't. It was a whole week ago, and here we are again. Um, it's the end of August, the 26th. I'm trying to do my best this week. I haven't been doing great. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but Aww. listen, I know we're okay. It's okay. I'm okay. We're all Okay. But I hope you're hanging in there. I don't know. Sometimes I think there's things that are just like, that just happen sort of like energetically, globally, you know, and everybody feels like a funk. Um, and then, of course, like, because, you know, the world is burning and um, it's a total shit show. <laughs> and it probably doesn't help that the RNC is having their like weird ass con- coked up convention this week <laughs> either to add to the energy being put into the world. Um, I'm busy, Phillips. This is Busy Phillips is doing her best. Two ladies are joining me who are also doing their best. My friends, Shantira Jackson, Casey St. Ange. Hi. Hi, guys. I, here's what I just, okay. Just on a positive note, here's what I did my best at. And here's what I'm continuing. Here's what I decided to do my best at this week. I decided to like take some health stuff into like like do my best at that and try to really just get to the bottom of it whether it's like psychological and emotionally tied and it's causing me to feel these things because you know I've like had this sore throat and the acid reflux and then my physical therapist came over and he's like I think you have adrenal fatigue and I that makes sense to me I've been reading about it and so I found this integrative medicine place that I, I have a consultation with today. Hopefully. Oh, yeah. I know. So I think that's good. And um, and then Michelle Williams, my best friend, not a big deal, guys, <laughs> <laughs> sent me, like, got her acupuncturist, herbalist person. I did, like, a consultation with that guy on the phone virtually it's kind of amazing now you can see a doctor anywhere because yeah no one's truly. seeing yeah. anyone in person so they're just like you can just see someone and also i realized that so many doctor's appointments are just appointments so that you can go that? to Someone other doctors house? that is the ups person i'm sure i leave this window open and then they wave to me <laughs> <laughs> like we're friends one time a guy came and I, I was like on a call for like an hour and a half and i was like oh, the people are here i have to go and he was like are you okay i was like thank you so much for knocking and then and he came back again the next week and he knocked and he was like, do you need me to, t- to help you? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he thinks you want to get off this podcast, Yantira. I hope I'll be not. Like, shout out to USPS, shout out to uh, UPS, FedEx, sometimes, not as much as the other two. But these homies <laughs> really coming in clutch when I'm on these calls. They like see the setup and he'd be like, do you want me to, you want Wait, me to knock hard? And I'd be like, we're cool, dude. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, right. Yeah. We got to save the post office now. Listen, I, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting time. It's a time, his, I mean, that I just feel like we will look back on in the future as like a very historic moment in our country and world. And we're all being sort of like called to action in different ways. And But I am tired. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm so glad you just said that. I'm I so am tired. Too. I'm so tired of being right. I'm so tired of being good. I'm so tired of helping. I'm not going to stop. Right. But it is exhausting it's to exhausting. be like, I just want everybody to, ha- to eat and have shelter. And then people be like, fuck you. And you're like, I, I like being able to pay their medical bills. Yeah. Or not yeah. have fucking medical bills. Like, I don't even know. I mean, look. We're doing our best. We're doing our best. I'm but trying am, so hard. I'm trying this week. really hard, but trying is exhausting. It's exhausting. If y'all are tired, shout out to you, man. You ain't the only ones. And, it's- and I've been, I like, 
Yeah, like I, I don't know. I've been trying all the things, you know, to like help myself through this time and make sure that I stay sort of like filled up so that I can remain active and like make the calls for Elijah McLean and Breonna Taylor and like, and then it's just something else that comes in like fucking hits you in the face and you're like, oh my God, yeah, Jesus I, Christ, can we just get like a break a for break. two seconds? Uh, two seconds. And that's what they want though. Uh, the whole point is to exhaust us. You go outside to to march, to, to donate your time, your energy, your money. Uh, you're like, cool, I did it for a week straight. And then it was like, oh no, there's literally 30 other bad things happening. And it's like, I just started making bread. I just try to do like <laughs> one really good, nice thing a week that like, and this week it wasn't even super, I don't think like, I do a lot of call to actions on my social media. And this week I saw um, some elders on a, um, on a, a reservation who want pin, mm-hmm. pin pals. And I was yeah. like, I'm going to do that this week I, I just saw like that. it's like That's I can't cute. do a I was like I can't do a bail bond this week I I just want to send a postcard to a very very nice old lady <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's really that. that's really nice but you are doing your best especially in bread baking I want it I want those purple potato I'll rolls. have to make you new ones so it's like you, I, I only make like 6 or 8 because like every recipe I don't know. I guess it's like from back in the olden times when everybody had like eight kids. Every recipe is like, and this makes 32 rolls. And it's like, <laughs> bitch, I'm not feeding a family of eight. I don't need 32 rolls. So like I cut recipes up and I'm like six. <laughs> I want six pieces of bread. <laughs> <laughs> Casey, I want to know how you're doing your best this week. Are you doing I- your best this week? How are you doing? Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I think I had a really busy week. Um, a so, podcast yeah, so is, same. A podcast is harder than I thought it was going to be, but no complaints. It's an adventure. Um, I wrote like a, an article for EW.com this oh, week. Oh, yeah. yeah. I liked your article a lot. If you oh, haven't really read nice. it, guys, uh, read it. I'll link it's it. just dropping knowledge, dropping truth bombs. <laughs> it um, is true. And it's also it also sort of ties into our guest today a little bit yes. because um Casey wrote an article for EW. They they asked for her thoughts on um what well, well you can explain late night. it. Yeah, late, just kind like, of like how um late night and daytime talk shows could do a little better behind the scenes because I know we all know the the current situation that's happening, but this is a situation that's happened over and over in all Wait, my years. Wait, but can I just say, maybe people don't know. <laughs> I, I, I just Hollywood feel like, because it's a, I, I feel like, yeah, we know because we're like live in this world, but it, and, and it was like trending on Twitter, but there's a lot that's going on in the world. And so maybe you don't know that there was like a big sort of, um, I was going to say a kerfuffle, but that does, that sounds like not like taking it serious staff enough for our right. staff. Yeah. But the, uh, the staff at Ellen, the daytime talk show Ellen, uh, <laughs> basically were like, came forward a lot of people and they said that it was a toxic environment and they had a lot of different feelings and, and things that they said yeah. happened while they were working there. I'm trying to be sort of like diplomatic because I... Yeah, sure. And I and it, it was handled in interesting ways. And then I feel yeah. like maybe now it's actually being kind of handled. But um, and well, some three people left the show. Left yes, the exactly. Show. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Get rid of those men anyway. Bye. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and I was trying to be diplomatic as well, because as I said in the article, um, whatever show you think it is that I'm talking about, that's the show I'm talking about because I have friends that work at every show. You know what I mean? So right. I've been doing this for so long that I literally know people that work at every show. And this isn't like a super unique problem. Workplace toxicity isn't a super unique problem. No. Um, I, I think it's it's really easy for it to happen. And I didn't really comment on the Ellen situation because I do have friends there 
that are, you know, bosses and I have friends that are workers there. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really want to comment directly on that situation. I just wanted to say in my experience, here's a good way to sort of prevent this type of thing. And like mitigate, mitigate the, the opportunity for toxic workplaces to, to grow in the first place. And, you know, I have to say like from my own experience working with you, you, I knew that I wanted you to be my partner and my showrunner, even though I will say that, you know, I think that a lot of times the initial sort of knee jerk reaction from these like studios and networks, when someone new gets a show is like, who's the old white man who's done this for 40 years and right, bring yeah. that guy in because we need like a boss. I also didn't want, what I also didn't want was somebody who was a woman who was just going to do the exact same thing that had been done forever and ever and ever. Right. And he, the interesting thing about Kate, I mean, like for those of you at home who don't know and Shantira can speak to it, like we were very small staff of people of oh, yeah. humans. Holly- Hollywood break from a, a writer's standpoint. <laughs> uh, Hollywood break. Uh, an average writer's room, like for your favorite sitcom, let's say you were like a, a real CBS baby, like you love the Big Bang Theory. Uh, those rooms have like 12, 14, 18, 20 people. Colbert, same thing. Uh, we had three people. <laughs> One, we two, three. three. We had one, one, two, two three, three. Three. Writers. And then, yeah. And then like everyone and then helping. Me, and, and then me and then Casey. And, we were working uh, our ass off. I swear to God, Casey and I had the same sort of theory going into it, but I wouldn't have had the ability to like say with confidence, like, yeah, we can fucking do this if I didn't have Casey next to me who's worked in this space for 20 plus years um, saying like, yeah, I'm pretty sure this woman who, um, you know, is very enthusiastic, but has never technically been a producer before. Well, women can don't be get to a be producer. Bad. Women don't get to be bad at stuff like right. Casey not having <clears throat> men will like uh, they will be given an opportunity to learn on the job. Women will not take a job until they already fully understand how their boss's jobs work. So right. even if you like think about patriarchy. Yeah, it's like of case. Of course, Casey would be a perfect showrunner because no woman is going to take a show running job unless they're capable a man 100 percent would be like i ain't never even watched tv I've but seen, i can I've run worked, that show yeah, I've, worked, I've worked with them but the truth but the truth is like you know casey's article is brings up such an interesting point because you know look like i i i just i know that a lot of shows have have made these pledges and like have these Ooh, plans boy. for like five year diversity Blah blah blah, blah 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 it's like it's guys, so long and it's it's also just it's just not that higher deep. Than yeah now. i was gonna say it's just not just that deep. Them. you just it's just, just you just hire I've people said a boss does it today Ouch. like yeah. right. you just, just do it hire people. you do it you do it today that's it there's no because by the way all those five-year plans and initiatives that you always hear nobody ever goes back to check on the progress of them no but, they just start them but <laughs> There really isn't a lot of progress oftentimes. You'll go back and then a year later, someone will write an article about the stats on daytime and late night shows and they remain dismal. So, you know, so people have a lot of, have the best plans, but. But also like, I think it's important to, to remember that um, one thing that you made a point of doing was you know, giving people shots and white men are so frequently given shots in repeatedly, repeatedly, (laughs) but like, but the opportunity to even get the shot is, is frequently given to white men at a younger age and more frequently than it is to women. And then especially women of color, um, in this industry, probably in all industries, you Absolutely. know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, but again, it's not rocket science and like no. people will rise to the occasion and Absolutely. sometimes they won't. And that's <laughs> okay too. And they, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's all, it's all 
gonna be fine, but you have to take the first step and it can't be this like 10 year plan that you're like, we're going to diversify. I am, I've been writing professionally. I've been in the industry. Like I got my first job in 2017, which isn't super long, but like uh, the first black woman to ever get a late night writing job <laughs> it was in 2014. So like, I'm, I mean, I'm three years in, that's like almost veteran, you know what I mean? And in a lot of these rooms, the ego of the men who've been mm. in charge for 40 or 50 years, you get a staff writer, you finally open the floodgates, a 23 year old black girl comes in and goes, hello, Mr. CBS, who's been here for 40 years. I don't think that's a great idea. And then you can't ever get a job again. <laughs> right, right, right. So, well, yeah, that, was we, part, that was part of what I was trying to say, too, is that like kind of, you know, if you look at your show and you realize you got a problem or you're starting a new show and you realize that you, you know, that you're going down a path where you have a problem, then you try to add a woman or any person of color to your staff because you want to try to remedy the problem. That's kind of like trying to have a baby to fix your relationship. You know, yeah. like, that's a big job for a baby. <laughs> and that's a big job for someone who's brand new to your staff to come in and expect them to, to, fix, the to fix the culture. That's your job when you're the boss. And so that's what I was kind of trying to nicely say. I and call I it the also- black signal. <laughs> That's what I call my, I tell my agents. I call it the black signal. It's yeah. when I'll get an email about a show and the room starts next week. Another Hollywood break. No room starts next week, you guys. Rooms right. start in two months. Rooms start in Six two weeks. weeks. Yeah. Rooms start yeah. at the end of the summer. No room starts next Thursday unless right. they already got a room and it's full of men and it's full of white people. And then they sit down and they realize and like, they fucked Oops. up. And then on Friday night, I get a black signal being like, can you submit to this show? It starts <laughs> next Thursday. And I, I always go, nope. Uh-uh. I don't <laughs> want that. I don't want nothing to do with that. You forgot about me. I definitely right. don't want to yeah. be. <laughs> I don't want to be in your room. Why <laughs> would I? Yeah. Why would I want to subject myself to that? Well, anyway, it's Casey, layers. Of, it's layers and layers of problems, mm-hmm. and I could talk about it for. Yeah, I feel like you really did uh, your best in that article because I do know that that's a little bit of a tricky position to be in, especially like, look, you know, we're still working on putting together all of our stuff, but like. You may be asking some people for jobs at some point. You, right. you know, you may be working with people at some point. You know how we I may love be to interview- ruin my career. <laughs> I know. Well, me too. Me too. Me too. Blow, blow that shit up. That was yeah, like somebody me too, on you guys. Yeah. No, 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 you don't. Wait. That was like somebody on Twitter. I we love reading all your comments on Instagram and Twitter about the show. By the way, um, somebody was like, "I want to know who the guest was that made Shantira so mad," and Casey responded, "I'll never tell." And I wrote, I probably will someday. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, Gina got her um, lady puppy surgery, her uh-huh. spaying surgery. Yeah. But when I went to go pick her up at the animal hospital, I did this, I, t- I talked about this on my Instagram stories, but I just, I really do want to tell you, the animal hospital was doing their best as well. Um, I arrived to pick her up post-surgery uh, the day after. They kept her overnight to like monitor her. Um and as I pulled up, you know, everything's COVID. So you go up, up outside yeah. and there's like a little check-in. And I'm like, hi, I'm here to pick up Gina Linetti. And um, the woman's like, oh, yeah. You know, there's this fire alarm. It's been going, I think we have to evacuate the hospital. So <laughs> it's going to be a few minutes. And I was like, I'm sorry, wait, what? Like, what do you mean? You have to evacuate the animal hospital? And so then I'm like standing in this courtyard with, you know, probably 10 other pet owners. Everyone's wearing masks. Obviously, we're trying to socially distant. And then this parade of animal hospital workers and pets starts coming out. I did watch that story and it looked like um, in Pee Wee's Big Adventure when there's That's what I felt like. I felt like I was in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. You guys, they legitimately rolled two dogs out that were in the middle of surgery (gasps) that were like intubated. (laughs) like Like on an intubation like ventilator and this one bulldog, I was like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Like (laughs) rolled out on the gurney with the like anesthesiologist and intubated the whole thing. I was like, really wanted to take a picture, but I was being respectful of the dog's (laughs) privacy. It is, you know, I just try to be, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put those animals. It's like, it's the same way. I won't post other people's children unless I have explicit 
permission from their parents sure. and the kids themselves. Well, the, sure. the Grey's Anatomy in me is like, is it still clean when you take it out? Do you got to start sure over? For not. not. Like, I'm not. like... I mean, it's not sterile anymore. We're just out and the, we're just raw dog in the air. We're just outside. <laughs> I don't Literal know. Literal raw dog. <laughs> it was so raw wild dog. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was really, it was really a wild experience. And it is like one of those, it only happens to me moments. Truly, that only you happens know? to you. I know. Like, that's the kind of stuff that if you took it to a writer's room and you were like, I went to go pick up my dog and there was a fire alarm and then they took all the dogs out of surgery the showrunner would be like that is crazy it's i'm not much. putting that in my tv show it's you gotta a hat pick, on a hat you gotta pick one you gotta pick one I know. <laughs> it's so weird i don't know what i did in another life to get such weird energy but that's like fun in this that's like a energy. fun story that's like a good story though it was a good story maybe but that maybe that's it maybe the universe is like we need to give her some podcast content now <laughs> Um, she can use these stories to. <laughs> that is the least the entertain can do people. For us. The least. <laughs> I kind of agree with you. So we all know how we were doing our best this week. Uh, let's talk about who else was doing their best this week and how um, they did. Yeah. Wait, I have a new screensaver as of this morning, and it is Harry Styles in the strawberry dress. In the strawberry dress. Strawberry do you guys, dress. Do you guys That's... know about the strawberry dress? Everybody? I know a little bit about it. I know it's expensive. The strawberry dress is expensive. Um, it is uh, by a designer from New York named Larika Matoshi. And um, it has become a viral sensation uh -huh. during the pandemic. Um, I first saw it when our dear friend Tess Holiday wore it. To the it Grammys. To the Grammys. Yes. And I was just like obsessed with it. And then... On TikTok, it got very popular. Yes, and a TikTok apparently, now. apparently, it has even been categorized under the hashtag cottagecore. Oh, the strawberry right. dress. Oh, okay. Um, which, and so, guys, which, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll post a photo of it. But if you do follow me on Instagram, so I did buy the strawberry dress, Mark and I did. That was our like one birthday present to Birdie this year. Aww. She was so cute. Per her request. The funniest thing was she was like, um, hey mom, I know what uh, you want. I know what I want you to get me for my birthday. It's like big present, but like it's all I want. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, tell me what it is. And she's like, it's a dress. I was like, it's just a dress? That's the one thing you want? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, it's this it's um this dress that has strawberries on it. And I was like, oh, the strawberry dress? Yeah, I know what that is. Sure. <laughs> like that's that's cool. Let me look. Yeah. Let me look online. And she was like, wait, how do you know what you know the dress? And I was like, Yeah, dude, I know the dress. I've I knew like, the dress before you knew the dress. <laughs> I had it in my shopping cart since January. Like since <laughs> since Tess Holiday wore it on the red carpet. And I was like, that's exact I want to wear that dress. Um but anyway. Harry Styles did like a photo shoot in it and I love it. I love his I community. love it too. I love <laughs> yeah, he has he has such an amazing fashion sense and he does remind me like of Prince in that yes, sense. Yes. I think that he, he just does. wears anything and he looks good in it and it yeah. doesn't when he wears a dress it doesn't make me think oh this dress is feminine or this dress is anti-masculine it's like, like oh art. this is a dress that should be worn by people with bodies yeah it's like art and I think he does like nod to Prince like um intentionally a lot so I love that obviously I feel like it's I feel like with Harry Styles it's like that plus um a little bit like uh Kurt Cobain I yeah. feel like oh, he's yeah. a, I feel like he's like a little bit trying to like break he's down a little toxic yeah. masculinity yeah. and like turn it on its head a little bit. Because yeah. he'll you know? wear a pretty dress, but he will look a little dirty. And also, by the way, like he should get all the kudos in the world. He's doing his best and he looks amazing. But I remember Tess getting some heat when she wore it back in January. People were really critical of that. And mm -hmm. I just, I think it's still bullshit. And so I um, just want to say that Tess was the first. She mm -hmm. looked amazing. Credit, and, you know, credit. Yeah, credit. Just Tess, like you. Well, Tess is why I wanted the dress. That's yeah. why I had it like bookmarked. Was yeah, because 
of how you're not, much I loved it on her. And I, I mean, like that is the fat phobia of America, though. Correct. Because you know? like the dress itself is art, right? Yes. And mm-hmm. the first person to wear it, uh, it's like, oh, this beautiful person is wearing beautiful art. But because she doesn't meet the the, the norms that have been set by fucking advertising agencies and stuff. No <laughs> one, everyone ignored it. But TikTok, TikTok teens who are like very small, <laughs> S-M-O-L, <laughs> very small, wore the dress and then it became like uh, like fashion iconic. I, I, I think about like Gabby Fresh and Nicole Byer. Yeah. They yeah. wear cool shit all the time. It's like yeah. mm-hmm. fashion is for is for bodies, and um, people don't want to pay attention until it's like on a smaller one. Which is nothing's <laughs> wrong with that, but still, like credit. <laughs> yeah, credit, credit, but also like it's an inherent bias that people have against like bigger bodies or whatever, you know, I was why I would always take umbrage with those who wore it best things yeah. because if you like, if you really fucking looked at it, it was always, people would always vote for the thinner person. I'm not even kidding. Like, right. and so it was always such bullshit. Cause it's like, it's not about who wore it best. It's like what your I fucked up idea of what a woman's body should look like wearing clothes. Do you know what I mean? And also, yeah. just like, why is it even a competition? Like, why is it, it a competition? If you put it on um, front ways and you didn't, you didn't put it with the boobs part in the back. You wore it. You were just great. Honestly, sometimes I mean, it's cute though to put the boobs part in the back. If you're if doing you crisscross, you know what if I mean. If you want to, but all I'm saying is, like, if you if you put it on and you went out, good for fucking you. You did it. You you succeeded in wearing a clothing. I love I Katie Storino. Do you know who she is? She is the founder yeah, of Me- yeah. Mega Babe. Yeah, Mega Babe started with this like thigh, uh, like anti chafing rub which by the way oh. if i had had that during my pregnancies it would have been a real game changer i really needed it <laughs> but she also has like boob dust for boob sweat which you know i'm oh, yeah. the biggest boob sweater of all time i have really like my ch- I, I like we can talk about this some other time but like I, <laughs> since we're now having so much uh time i'm thinking about getting a reduction like when i hit my <gasps> 30s i really at a, i'm at a 38 g yeah you have big big boobs and let me tell you, the and you're sweat, not you're tiny. Does it hurt your back? The yeah, it hurts my back. I like but also you know like when your parents tell you stuff and you're like whatever, mom. My mom was like, when you hit your thirties, your boobs are gonna get big. And I was like, leave me alone. You see, I'm living my <laughs> truth in these bees. I hit thirty, boom, double D's. I'm thirty three now. I'm at a thirty eight G. And you you know don't want to have kids, right? We're in the G club together, Shantira. They're heavy. Let's. I mean, Casey, just real talk. They, they be heavy. <laughs> yeah, it's like having two extra heads. It's just too, it's too big. And also, Guys. we did a, we did a bra uh, special on Busy Tonight. Oh, it's fun. And like, I spent a year wearing sports bras because I like literally couldn't find a bra. I was like, yo, I'm gonna have to wear a sports bra because these underwires ain't cutting it. I went to um, Jeanette's uh, and we got. I wore. She was like, you're a 38. F thirty eight G and I was like, girl, and those boobs, those bras, hundred and sixty dollars. Shout out to everybody trying to support those girls because that's like a a small baby that costs a hundred and sixty dollars every time you want to <laughs> get her dressed. <laughs> Speaking of having babies, Chrissy Teigen is having a baby, but she's also having like another controversy on Twitter about it's so making annoying. eggs. I- I was watching it last night. I was like it's reading it so on Twitter. Annoying. It's like, so, yeah, she it. can't. I don't know. She gets like, she really gets the fucking crazy. She can't crazies. breathe. Explain, she can't breathe. I mean, this is, I'll explain to people. She did a little demonstration because as we know, Chrissy is a cooking expert, has several cookbooks, has cookware line, attended culinary school. So she just did a simple I didn't know thing she went like, to culinary school. She did. I didn't know that. That's really um, cool. Yeah. So, she just showed a simple tutorial of how to fry two eggs. 
Sunny side was, up. How to make sunny, the perfect sunny side up egg. Which yeah. like, that's a great question along with like, how do you sew on a button? Those are things like adults should know how to do, but yeah. often don't know how to do. So she did this really quick tutorial and then people gave her shit for it. For being no, wrong. No, one fucking dude yeah, was like- one dude. A one person. dude like tried to mansplain to her that- um, You can't use oil. You shouldn't use olive oil. Those eggs are going to taste like shit, which is like, A, have you ever been to Italy? You fucking idiot. Also, <laughs> have you ever been to an Italian restaurant that serves brunch? Because you don't well, even need to go to Italy to have like an egg olive that's oil. been fried in olive oil that tastes and it's, amazing. Yeah. And it's the way that he said it. He said rookie mistake. And it's rookie like, move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rookie that move. That goes and it's back just like, to what we were talking about. How a man will tell somebody who's been to culinary school that they don't know how to make an egg. This also, other woman kind of came... <laughs> to um, Chrissy's defense. Um, you know, she's like the queen of like the clap back. I like love when she, mm -hmm. you know, puts people right where they belong. But uh, this other woman was just like, dude, like, what are you, what are you on about? Like, this has been described as the quintessential way by, you know, Eric Repair and Anthony Bourdain and Jose Andreas. And then Jose <laughs> Andreas, like, quote tweeted Dan and said, those are probably the best ever and looking like tasty. Bless you, Jose. Sunnyside <laughs> eggs ever filmed. What is he talking about? <laughs> At Chrissy Teigen, keep it up. But Dan... Dan, Ho Jose is an angel. Like, it's so annoying to me that people like Chrissy, who I think that she's a good person. She wants to put good stuff into the world. She's pregnant. Doing her best. She's, she's doing she's her best. Do it. She literally has been doing her best since she became a Terminator. <laughs> and... <laughs> you guys know about my Terminator theory. Okay, we, that's a sidebar for another time. That's a time. whole, uh, that's a special but, episode. But like, she's just like, these times are tough, man. This is like, this is my internal Chrissy monologue. These times are tough, man. I'm gonna just like film myself making this perfect fucking egg and put it on Twitter. This is a nice, this is nice. I would want this. And she posts it. And two seconds go by. She can't fucking breathe Dan, without And fucking her. Dan shows up. And he's like, your eggs are going to taste like shit. Like, <laughs> what is that inclination that these motherfuckers have to just like shit on a thing that like, it's not offense. Like, why is it offensive to you, Dan? It is why? the internet. It is the internet. It's purely the internet because in real life, we don't do that to people. I just like, I understand the desire to be seen. Mm -hmm. I understand fundamentally that in this time right now like we all are no matter if you're Chrissy Teigen or you're Dan or you're you know a woman from Ohio or wherever you are that you have a desire and a need to be seen and heard and felt because it's really fucking hard out there you know yeah. or aka in in here in your closet <laughs> or your house or wherever the fuck you are However, why do people think that the way to get the attention is to put negative things out into the world? Because negative attention never does the trick. It only succeeds in making you feel more like shit. Am I wrong? Dan is not hungry for eggs. Dan is hungry for attention. Right. And he got it. Also, I... I I wonder, just have manners when you're mm -hmm. speaking to someone out in the world. I think like, I think something happened, I want to say about 15 years ago, where I would always see people say something really unkind and then just say, I'm just being honest. I can't Ugh. lie. I can't lie. Ugh. And I'm like, you can be honest and still be kind. Yeah. That man, if he truly was passionate about buttered eggs, he could have said, Oh, that's interesting. I prefer to make my eggs with butter, but it's interesting that you like it with olive oil, but he chose not to. He was just unkind and rude because people have no fucking manners. And I trace it back to this, like, I'm just being honest. I'm just saying. Like, you know, people are still using that worn out catchphrase. I'm just saying. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I know you're just saying something but like, shitty. like, don't say it to me. Also, I think people need to make a distinction between being honest about your opinion 
yes. and being honest about a fact. Yes. Yes. Like, because <laughs> there are two, those are two separate things. Your opinions are not facts. Are not facts. They are your opinions. My opinions are just my opinions, guys. That being said, I have had the moments of life where I've been like, ugh, Chrissy Teigen's eggs. You know, I mean, yeah. not really, not in this, you know what I mean? Yeah. Theoretically. Yeah. Chrissy Teigen's eggs, whatever it was in that moment. And I've, I've also had the self-awareness and the self-control to like not act on that shitty impulse and to be like, oh, you know what? This is about me. That's a shitty impulse. And I'm not going to like put anything out there. You can say it to your fucking girlfriend, Dan, or your husband or whatever. Yeah. Well, it's the group chat. Some stuff you have to say for the group chat. And everybody don't have no group chat. Half the shit I see on the, on Twitter should go to the group chat. Guys, this is it. Shantira <laughs> just, this is like, Shantira, this is your Oprah moment for today. <laughs> Guys, you got to get a group chat for the things yeah. that you Save cannot. Save it for your homies. <laughs> you don't you don't need to put into the world like publicly everything. Some things belong on a group thread with three other people. And make sure that you and make sure that like you know those people very well and you love them <laughs> and that you're pretty sure that they'll never use it against you. But even if they do, I do think that it's admissible to say to others, I'm sorry, that was a secret group thread where we were just getting rid of like our stuff. Save it for the group chat. And also, if you need to, have a subgroup chat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I had um, an ex husband of a friend of ours. <laughs> I thought you were making a big like announcement. You. I had an ex husband. No, I, I was like, I've no. literally never heard wouldn't this. That be, wouldn't that be like so fu fucking fascinating if, like, in the, like, did you guys ever have friends who found out, like, when yes. you were in your early 20s that their parents had been married before to other people and yes. they just oh my had never told them? Like, it's crazy that. That, you know, I'm friends with my college boyfriend, Colin Hanks, and like our daughters are best friends. That's so and cute. it's so cute. I love it. And his wife and I are like very, very close friends. And they're like family to us. But at some point, those little girls are going to find out that Colin and I dated. And I don't even know. I would be super weird out, weirded out if I were a kid and found out that like, my Uncle mom Colin. <laughs> used to date my best friend's dad when they were 19. But like Birdie knows. And I'm like, Birdie, it's like, you know, it's like Santa. Like you can't tell. It's just like, let's just, let's yeah. just keep it in a keep place it, where we don't talk about it. Keep it in the group it. chat. Yeah. What about <laughs> we, Santa? Santa is the best and we love <laughs> Santa. Um, okay. By the way. Okay, wait, wait, wait. What was I saying? Before you were saying, we, oh, have you ever had oh, a friend? Uh, no, we had a, a, a our fr I had an ex-husband of a friend of ours. Um, I was trying to do the thing where like you remain friends with both people and like, because like guys, it's not the fucking eighties. Like people can just You don't get, have to choose. You don't, and people can get terrible. divorced. Right. And this is what happened. But like also everybody do therapy and like do your work. And unless someone is like truly, you know, like got some, look, I don't know your life, whatever, make your own choices. But I do think that a lot of times there isn't an, a need for things to be contentious when people split up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes it's just like, we all have to accept that like we move into different spaces and that's just what happens and whatever. Yeah. But so, and that's what I thought had happened in this relationship with my friends. And so I was trying to like be friends with both of them and the ex-husband and I were hanging out and he was like, well, you know what she said about you, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, dude, let me tell you something. Do you know what I've said about her to Mark? Like, what you say to your significant other about any of your friends is not admissible as a real thought or feeling. Like, yeah. and so everything that he was trying to like poison me against her with, I was like, you're just the asshole who's like breaking the trust of a safe space to say gross stuff. She, she didn't gave, say she, it. She gave it you to know the what group mean? chat and he broke yes. the circle. He broke okay. the, you, you, the your partner, your, you, if you don't have a partner, you need to get a group chat. And if you are a partner and you separate, I want to tell you this, that if you break the circle of the, of the trust of talking shit in your lowest moments, to try to sell out your ex-partner, you're an asshole. You're an asshole, yeah. 
it, you're going to lose. I think it's, I think it's on you. Casey, yeah. do you agree with me? <laughs> you're just looking at me. No, I, I mean, I agree. I, th there's often things that I say to my husband, like, I can only say this to you. And it's, I realize that it's because I'm trying to like work it out myself. You know, right. I'm trying to work it out how I feel about it. And can I deal with what's happening? And, you know, and, and it's a lot about how it's making me feel and why it's making me feel that way. But you can't just say it in mixed company. No. So, it's yes. Insane. There's some stuff that only your SO can uh, hear. You can do because, like, sometimes you just like, be like, I can I be an asshole real quick, and yeah. then you're like, all right, asshole, and they know that you're not a bad person, and they know that it's not real, and you just get to say how you feel, and right. then you like go eat chips on the couch and never talk about it, right? <laughs> and and I think the same thing is true too with the group texts. You yes. know, like you can have you have to have like a couple safe friends where you can just be like, dude. Chrissy Teigen's uh, eggs look like shit. Chrissy, yeah. we love your eggs. I'm just saying that's what Dan needed, like a safe space. Your eggs looked perfect. But you know what I mean? I think you need to be aware that the things that you put into the universe like affect other people. That's it. That's all. That's all. That yeah. if you put something out publicly, you have it, it regardless of what your intent or your or your initial sort of thing, you have to be really consider it that you could be hurting someone else and you have to think about it like is this fucking joke worth it or should I just send it to Shantira and Casey yeah and it's like you better just send that anything that you're like this is funny just for my friends just send it to them the internet is not your friend <laughs> the internet oh my god say it again Shantira say it one more time the, the internet is not your friend <laughs> it most certainly and is if not. you don't if you don't have a group chat, maybe we can. We haven't made a Facebook page for this podcast yet, but maybe we'll do that. And maybe people that are listening can go on the Facebook page, meet each other, and get a group chat going. Get like a busy, a busy and friends group chat. Yeah. Wait, because guys, I do know that guys, like, it's wait, hard out here. Let's. I don't. I don't like Facebook. You know, I don't have it. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I, don't I don't have don't it either. I was going to be like, okay. <laughs> I know that it's really complex. I know that I'm I'm in a complicated space because of my Instagram popularity and how much I love Instagram, and I know that there. Are owned by Facebook at this point but like if you need to be in a group chat can we just do an experiment if sure. you need to be in a group chat will you email our email and say I need to be in a group chat and we will pair you with two other people who have written in is that crazy? Do you guys no, think that's insane? I think that's insane? so fun. Okay. I think that our listeners are also like very like nice people. I hope and so. And I think that like if you're a stalker is this, yeah. do I have a liability in this um, <laughs> by I, doing this? I, I, I know I think there's it's... always paperwork that can be signed, but I do think that our people would be chill and, yes. and, and nobody uh, be weird. Yeah. Don't be weird. Just like you send yeah. us an email to busy doing her best at gmail.com. Send us an email with the subject group text and tell us your name, your age, where you live. And three things that you're interested three in. Three things that you're interested in. And we're going to put together, and you guys, I want to do this. If you want to do it, I want to do it. But I, I, rem I uh, remove myself from all liability. For <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Me too, me too. In your, in your email, say that you, you submit to, having, to being paired and having your email given to someone, a stranger, yeah. who who's, has similar interests. Would you want to, I feel like that's... I feel like that's super fun, guys. I, think I don't it's know. Fun, especially during right now. I know so many people who are like living at home with their parents yeah. or are like in an apartment by themselves or like I have really close friends who live close by, but we're not. I mean, like I used to just be kissing my friends on the mouth. The times have changed, you know, um, which brings us to our guest today. Uh <laughs> I want to be on a group thread with our guests. Uh, I really had a lovely time talking with Rosie O'Donnell. Yeah. She was incredible. And for those of you that don't know, our dear Casey St. Ange, after she was David Letterman's assistant, guys, she could write a fucking book. <laughs> but she won't because she's not that kind of person. I, I have am. manners. <laughs> not me I would the book would have already been out um she went to work on the Rosie O'Donnell show and so much of the stuff that we talked about earlier today I really think 
Rosie is responsible for creating an environment in that show that was unlike anything Casey had ever experienced before and kind of showed you the possibility of the way that things could be. And by all accounts, it was a pretty magical six years on that show, including including the fact that, well, I'm going to let you guys listen to it because Casey has a really sweet, she says a really amazing thing to Rosie that I'm just going to... I'm just going to dare you to not cry when it happens. Because <laughs> I just listening to it this morning, I truly like started crying. Listen, we've only had a few of these chats, but so far, one of my faves, Rosie O'Donnell. Uh, so listen, I'm definitely have been upping my vitamin intake. I'm on this like path of trying to sort of figure out everything and stay healthy. And I do think that vitamins are important. And there is a company called Care Of that is like a new wellness brand and it makes it easy to maintain your health goals because they give you a customized vitamin plan. Um, And it'll just help you feel your best and will support you long term. And I have to tell you guys, this is the thing that as an actor in Hollywood, I would know many people who were very famous and rich who would have these special doctors that they would go to who would give them like a customized vitamin thing and they would take like, you know, 4,000, you know, like whatever. They would have their little like customized vitamins that were getting them all better, you know. Well, you don't have to um, go to the doctor that costs a billion dollars to do that because Care Of uh, will do it for you. And you take an online quiz. It's a five-minute online quiz that takes, you know, asks you questions about your diet and your lifestyle and your health concerns um, and addresses your specific goals, wellness goals. And I feel like sometimes I... I know that I want something and then I go to, you know, Whole Foods or whatever. And I'm like, what? I don't even know. There are so many different vitamins. What do I choose? And how do I make sure that these ones like won't hurt my stomach and will go together and whatever. Um, And I feel like care of is just so easy because, and it's, you know, clean ingredients backed by science. And, um, They're very transparent about the research and the sourcing behind every one of their products. They have extensive information. And everything comes daily, individually wrapped packets that, you know, are perfect to remind you to take them all. Uh, So for 50% off of your first Care Of order, go to TakeCareOf.com and enter the code BEST50. 50% off is a lot takecareof.com and enter the code BEST50 B-E-S-T the number five the number zero I've always enjoyed a fizzy drink anyone who knows me knows that I also enjoy it if maybe it's got something else in it like spiked it's a hard (laughs) it's a a hard uh, Hard seltzer, for instance. Well, I got to try Vizzy Hard Seltzer and I'm kind of obsessed. It's amazing. It's a good cocktail for when there's a heat wave like there is right now over ice. Um, But one thing that I love is that it has added vitamin C. I love vitamin C and it's an antioxidant. I love it. Um, the singer and the vitamin. <laughs> I do too. I love both of those things. Um, and there's lots of flavors. Personally, I liked black cherry lime, but Ooh. there's also strawberry kiwi, pineapple mango. And I also really liked blueberry pomegranate. Those are my two favorite black cherry lime and blueberry pomegranate. There's um, no dent in those mixtures you know sometimes you get a mixture and you're like that's the one i don't want those are all good those are all good mixes so you you can enjoy refreshment and also some vitamin c and vitamin c is my jam listen just up you can upgrade your hard seltzer and get busy 
you guys get busy. Is that their <laughs> slogan? It should be get busy with it. <laughs> no. Am it I the only good. one? I no, think but it's your funny. Is also busy. I like, know. Busy says get busy with it. It's busy fun. says get busy. <laughs> um, to find out where you can purchase busy, go to busyhardseltzer.com. That's V I Z Z Y H A R D S E L T Z E R dot com. Busy says all good ones. Let's get busy. I don't need to tell you, you must be 21 years or older. I'm so happy to know that this is not going out. I took a bath. I tried to <laughs> fix my hair and I'm like, now it's not going out. I'm so happy. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Hi. how are you? Nice I'm to good. meet you. It's so nice to meet you. I've been such a huge fan for so long. I would dream, dream. I would do, when I was in college at Loyola Marymount University, oh no, am I going to cry already? Uh, <laughs> I would drive back to Arizona and I would practice my interview with you in the car. Oh, <gasps> that is so cute. Yeah. You know, I used to do that with Johnny Carson when I was like 16. I had pimples and I was sit on my bathroom and I'd go like, so Johnny Carson, when I was 16, I used to sit on my bathroom and talk to you. Like I was doing like Jerry Seinfeld's effect. Yeah. And yeah. yeah it, that was, thing. it was like my that's dream. True. I remember watching you and uh, I grew up in Tallahassee, Florida. And that's the first, that was my first introduction to Broadway. I didn't, I didn't know that that was like a thing. And yeah. I remember being like, all these people can sing. This is so cool. <laughs> and I really want to wear those koosh toys. <laughs> yeah, those toys, toys. I made to say, a lot of money for that guy. I know. Yes. Well, like, I feel like you made a lot of money for a lot of other people. <laughs> yes, we did. We made a lot of money. We were able, you know, I felt like it was a good use of my power to try to be like the mafia for existing nonprofits that were credited. Right. So like if somebody said after I did Tickle Me Elmo, which was a real thing, my son yeah. actually really liked it. So that's why I brought it on TV. Then they would come in the week after and go, oh, by the way, this is the new Dolly Lolly doll. The Lolly, <laughs> could you say you love it? I'm like, <laughs> if I'm going to do things, I'm going to rip you off and I'm going to make you pay a lot to charity in order to get me to do something. And that's what we did. We raised millions of dollars. It's genius. You were an influencer. Yeah. You were the first influencer, essentially. And, it, and I really did feel like Robin Hood, I have to tell you. I felt like, you know, when when they would say, give away this toy, and I'd say, can you send 2,000 toys to this hospital? And they would. I know. Oh my God, that's amazing. You it's send kids you send kids to college. You kept families in their homes. And everything that everybody saw on the show was only like, a hundredth of it. Right, exactly. It is innately my nature to be that way. Like it has been since I was a little kid. Like we won a bread album on a radio channel, WBLI, <laughs> right after my mother died. So like 1973. And my brother, Danny, who was a year older than me, he's the one who won it. And the whole family, like it was the first thing we did after my mother died. We all got in the car together and we went to WBLI and we got a brand new record. And it felt unbelievable to me. Like everything bad that had happened was like, look at this moment of grace that we're getting. And so to give someone a moment of grace, to facilitate that in an actual real way, not like, can you hold up the lolly dolly doll now, mm -hmm. right? In a real yeah. way. Then that's what, what was real about the show was that everything was true, except oh. for I did know the mystery guests. <laughs> is that true? Oh, you did. It is true. I did. Well, you got to be prepared. You know what I mean? Because you don't, you don't love a surprise, right? I don't love a surprise. Me neither. No, no. I said, listen, I will fake anything you tell me to do, but I will not have you like come on. Like I, you know how Ellen surprises everyone? I hate it. I've never done that show because I'm terrified she's going to scream, scare me, have give me a heart attack. Yeah, no. I, I mean, I don't know if you saw it, but a couple of years ago, there was she scared Kris Jenner and that woman almost broke her leg. I'm telling you. It was like <laughs> terrifying. Yeah. Chantira, you've seen it. We, oh, we yeah. watched it I don't together. I like to be scared. I'll cry. Um, I was curious. I thought of you first as an, I mean, I knew of you first as an actor um, and like a, you are really talented and super like every time you're in something it's critically acclaimed and I know this much is true you're getting of course like obviously 
people love you on that. You're getting rave reviews for that. But Smilf, like you were like amazing. But when you decided to do the talk show, I was curious if you had like how that came to you. Had you guest hosted with Regis? In my head, that's how it happened. That's exactly how it happened. I guest hosted (laughs) with him. I had a new baby, my first baby. Parker. Parker. and I I remember. (laughs) I went to do a movie, Harriet the Spy, and I had to get a nanny because I hadn't had a nanny till then. And he was like, you know, eight, nine months old. So I got this, my house cleaner, Maria, I asked her to come with me to the movie set to help take care of him. And when I came home after like the second day of 12 hours, he wouldn't come to me. He would, he was staying with Maria and I'm like, come here, boo boo, come here. He would not come. And I thought I need a job where he can grow up with his cousins Mm. and his family around him, where I'm going to be there every day to take him to school to do, you know, and then Kathy Lee said she was leaving Regis. She did it a lot. Remember, she would say that (laughs) she was leaving. One of these times happened to coincide with right after I filmed that movie, Harriet the Spy. So I called my agent and said, tell them I want Kathy Lee's job. So they called. And um, at the time I had done it a lot and I loved Regis. I mean, I just loved him. But um I said to my, my agent said, well, listen, Kathy Lee's not leaving, but they actually want to talk to you about doing your own talk show. And I was like, really? They were like, yeah. I was like, well, if I did it, I would have to do it like Mike Douglas and Merv Griffin <laughs> where nobody gets hurt. You know, I used to watch those shows and think, oh my God, Tony Fields is going out to dinner right now with mm-hmm. Sammy Davis and Merv mm-hmm. and the comedian who was yeah. on. Like I had this whole fantasy yeah. with Right. And I thought that's where Hollywood was and where Hollywood lived. And it was not, you know, what it is now. It's not like the Internet. It's not everybody. Clickbait and trying oh, to get yeah. someone to say the wrong thing so that you can, like, get a bunch of people to click on the article. Exactly. And it's it's a whole different world. Like, I don't know what. I don't know how people stand it. You know, there are people who. um you know, are they just, they live in that zone. And yeah. I guess, you know, what, what the big pivot for me, because I know that's like a big theme. It is, guys, yeah. Is when I left that show. Because right. I, I started that show because I had a son. And I left that show because I had four children under the age of six. It's crazy. It's crazy. I did what my mother <laughs> did every two years. Give me another one. And if my ex, Kelly, hadn't said, I'm not doing another one, there would be a lot more. Oh my god! <laughs> like eight. Yeah, I, I I get it. I have two, but I have my my thing is like when they're further apart, and I miss the baby. I love a baby. Yes, I love a baby too. It's incredible. So the pivot when you after your fourth kid to end the talk show really kind of like it was still. I feel like it was a huge show still. Yeah, it was. was. You you went out on top. <laughs> right. Rosie, I have this memory of like when they, you know, when you announced that you were going to sort of go off the air and, um, you know, and we all knew that it was, it wasn't a surprise. We all knew that it was coming. But I remember that we had... Um, like a rap meeting, like a staff rap meeting. And I feel like I used to always, or for whatever reason, we used to always end up sitting next to each other in big meetings. And I remember our executive producer, Bernie Young, was talking to us about, oh, the, you know, the show's ending. Here's how this is going to go. And I remember you kept whispering to me, can you believe it's going to be over? What are we going to do? Exactly. (laughs) You know, and people were telling me, Jim Paratori told me, you will never have this much power. You will never have this much money. This is stupid for you to walk away. You could, you know, have generational wealth. I said, my brother just told me that I have a hundred million dollars. Jesus. You know what Christ. that means? That means it's time for me to stop. Wow. I have enough money. I can't use money as the reason. But I had these four little children that my mother died at 39. Right. She never got to parent her children, you know. So I left right at around the age that, you know, uh, like my my oldest boy was about to turn seven. Parker was about to turn seven. And I jumped and it took a while to get back to earth. And, you know, when you jump, it makes everyone else in the plane question, why didn't they jump? Right. 
Right. And so you get a lot of slings and arrows coming at you. People, you know, like people saying things that aren't true that get, you know, and, and listen, Donald Trump didn't help with that, you know, for me and the, the all of the papers that he was coordinating with and, Ugh. you know, that whole uh, yeah. insanity. But all that came after the show, because when you're on a show daily and people get to see you live, mm-hmm. you're going to know that person. Right. By the way, Casey told me you don't love that view book, but I read it. The yeah. ladies who lunch the view thing. Right. But I thought you came off really amazing on the book, in the book, and and also, and, like, very truthful and honest and, like, owning your own shit, but also just being, like, yeah, it was weird. They they built, like, your personalities up on the show, almost, like, in a narrative, like, way to pit you guys against each other to create yes. this whole thing. That yeah. must have been, like, I don't know. I That must have just been wild after it was totally wild to do it the first time and then have the ratings go so high and have the you know them asking am I going to stay am I going to not and so my agent and my based on what I used to make on on my own show and you know they asked for five million dollars a year which is not that much really if you're right. gonna for them for ABC mm-hmm. and they, got they it. pay that and I said okay then I'm gonna go thank you anyway you know I couldn't do more fighting with people for a living. And then after I had announced that I was going to go, that's when it got really bad. Oh, man. Because again, I was leaving. Like I was, you know, leaving, but I couldn't do inauthenticity. Right. But it also feels like you're somebody who is willing to stand up for what you believe in, like speak up for those who aren't able to speak up for themselves or help people out in that way. And that you feel injustice deeply and you want and you won't stand for it. And that to me, that which is a really incredible characteristic feels like it was just totally exploited. Like yeah. that people yeah. knew that about you, like the producers or whatever, and that they just totally exploited that part of your personality to make, you know, their well, ratings. The problem with the view too, was that Bill Getty was the producer who was, you know, a very right wing Trumpian, mm-hmm. you know, and he's controlling the only show on TV where it's all women. Like, I couldn't believe that he even would have a say in what we were doing. I felt that he was disruptive to the process and not helpful. And, um, you know, listen, it got bad. It's hard to take. It's hard when you're sensitive to Mm -hmm. take all the negativity that comes. You know, Um, I left right before we got into the war. And thank God that I that was God protecting my psyche and myself because that was not a good time for me, you know? So I feel like when I said I was going to pivot out of my show, that was from the beginning. I told Casey at the beginning, I'm doing five years and I ended up doing six, Mm -hmm. but I said, I'm telling you right now, I'm not doing more than five years because he'll be six years old and he has to go to school, you know? So I I always knew that was the truth. Other people on the staff didn't seem to believe it. (laughs) And and I really, I really remember we would um, line up at your office to do a writer's meeting first thing in the morning, every morning, like seven o'clock. We had already been there for an hour coming up with pitches. And I remember executives cutting the line every morning when the when your end date was coming close, being like, we just have to get we just have to get in there and talk to her for a second. And they were coming in there with checks. More and more money trying to convince you to stay. And every time we'd go in and and we'd be like, what'd you tell him? And you were like, no, I said no. And, you know, just that's I the it was very hard to do. I'm telling you, it was hard to do because there is something that it fills. There is some space in your life that Mm -hmm. it fills. But your perspective is so skewed as to what's important and what's valuable about you as a human being. And just about being in the world as a participant, right? It was it was too much focus um, for not having a daily show. Because if you have a daily show, you can't fake your essence. Mm-hmm. You know, right. you can't. And I, I think you, you can't. Can well, <laughs> you can't, Rosie. Through. I can't do that. Right. Right. And there's no amount of of money or anything that could make me do that. 
That's why I have compassion for Ellen, right? I have compassion, even though, you know, I hear the stories and I understand. I think she has some social awkwardness. I mm-hmm. think from knowing her for so many years that, um, you know, I have my own uh, kind of history with her. And Right. Well, they just ripped your show off. <laughs> well, well, it wasn't my format. I didn't create it. They ripped off the Merv Griffin ripoff. But yes. <laughs> so <laughs> you're very humble. I don't remember That's like... Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. It's true. I I can't own the format, but was it weird that like my producers went over to her show and, and that then a lot of, you know, it it was, it's odd, it's awkward. And then, you know, it ended up, I never did the show. And then people are like, why haven't you done the show? I want to say a couple things um, that I hope aren't digressions. First of all, the original intent of the Rosie O'Donnell show, which I was there for from day one might have been to emulate Merv Griffin, but Rosie, you innovated daytime television, television, period. You brought music back to television. I was going to say, even what Shantira said, to bring, oh no, I'm going to (laughs) cry, to bring musical theater into the homes of people across the country who could only dream of going to New York City and seeing a Broadway show is so monumentally huge. I mean, do you know how many kids in like Ohio like got to see these cats and- No one's doing it still. Every young waiter in New York says to me, (laughs) oh, my God, you don't understand. I'm from Utah. Yes. And I saw your show and Ragtime was singing. And I'm I'm just going. I'm now I'm here. I'm trying to be an actor (laughs) all the time. And, And I did think when we were doing that somewhere, we're sparking the new Sondheim. That's right. We're sparking some kid somewhere. And beyond that, beyond that, the comedy, the games, the song parodies, without you, I firmly believe there is no Jimmy Fallon. Without you, I believe there is no James Corden on Late Night. A hundred percent. And also just human interest. You made human interest a thing and you made women's health a thing and everything that was happening on camera that was inclusive and informative and was really, really funny, but had a lot of heart. The same thing was happening behind the scenes. Our executive producer was a black man. I don't know. Was he the first ever black executive producer of a talk show? I don't know. But we had... We had a fully inclusive staff and, you know, when I got surprise pregnant when I was 26, I knew that there was a place uh, I could keep my job and come to work every day and bring my baby there. You know, so you were just, you were doing a lot of things that it not just influenced, but like made my whole, I don't know what my whole mission in life has been to continue to do things as well as you did them back then. Oh, Casey, that's so nice to hear. But here you were this really intelligent woman who had been at David Letterman for all these years. And then you're like my assistant. And I think you're still a little shell shocked. And I said, like, what's going on? And you're like, well, I'd really like to be a writer. I'm like, okay, let's do it. You know? Yeah. And you've succeeded and beyond. Look what you're creating now. This is a great, I, I love the show that you guys did. I watched Thank it I, with my teenager. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my my 17-year-old daughter, who is um, very into it. And uh. it was great. I think, you know, it's hard for women, period. It's hard now for the, you know, but this is the greatest format, don't you find? Yeah. Yeah. Because we're all like, I don't even have pants on right now. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I I just feel like in just the few episodes that we've done so far, my husband was listening to the podcast yesterday and he was like, you know, that's what you wanted Busy Tonight to be, remember? You just with Shantira and, you know, you guys just talking about things and getting into these stories. But imagine if imagine if they would let you pick who you wanted to have that show. Imagine right. if they would let you make a new view a really politically relevant view, a view that's not what it is on TV now, right? What it could be, what it was at one point, I think. Wait, Rosie, are we doing this? Is that what we're doing, Casey? (laughs) I'm not kidding. Are we we selling this? (laughs) Oh my God, you guys, it's the next pivot. Um, It could be. You guys, this is what I love to do. If I could do this every day for a living, I would do it, you know? Um, I love your acting so much. I know I'm coming back to this, but I start, you know, as an actor, I found 
some fulfillment and I had some really incredible roles. And then I found a lot of times where I just felt like I can't work for these old white men anymore and like be told to lose weight and to be, you know, just the whole thing. Like I just couldn't do it. And I had would fill in a couple times for Kelly Ripa with Michael Strahan. And I it was around that time that I was really starting to use my Instagram, whatever. And I was just like, this is it, man. This is the fucking life. With my kids, I could like go do this show for a couple hours. Nice. And and it changed like the way that I thought about moving forward. That's not to say though that I don't sometimes like want to go back to acting, although I tell everyone I'm retired from it. Um, what does it take? But now I say that conditions must be perfect in order for me to act. Right. What do you say in order for Rosie to take a role? What does it like? What does it have to have at this point? Listen, I did a lot of movies for a woman uh, my height, age, size, and presentation. Come like, on, I, I said to Casey, I loved East of Eden. Exit That's to right. Eden. Exit to Eden. Right. Exit to Eden. I owe you, to Eden. I owe you money for rent. I hope you rented it. You didn't go to the <laughs> but, um, So I did a lot of movies with a lot of great producers and directors like, you know, Nora Ephron. Yeah, you worked and, with Nora Ephron a lot. And Penny so cool. Marshall. And yeah. just, you know, like I was I had the greatest life that a comedic actress could have asked for of my generation. I was for a few years. Three summers in a row, I was in the number one movie. I mean, wow. come on. Right. Wow. So that's really crazy, isn't it? Yes. And, um, that was my career. So when I got older and, you know, it was hard for people to find roles for women in their 40s. And right. now, listen, I'm 58 now. I knew when I turned about 60 that I was going to start getting work. Right. I knew mm. because I didn't have plastic surgery, because yeah. I... You know, they need a Geraldine Page in pretty much everything. <laughs> you know, they need a Kathy Bates. They need a, someone yeah. to play that part. And I feel like I've lined myself up to be waiting for what will be my glory days of, of acting in the future. That's what I feel. But, you know, does it have to all work out? Yes. Um, I don't get a lot of offers. It's not like a lot of people are going, you know, you know what my... Yeah. You, what my flavor of ice cream is. It's not like something new, right. you know, right? So people had to take a risk. Uh, listen, <laughs> I know what an average person's face, I love my face. I think I'm a good person. <laughs> I don't want a better face. Like, I'm pretty happy. I wish my smile went up a little more. That's kind of grimacing, you know, but on the whole, you know, the women who are beautiful, and I've seen this in my career, all my friends that you know, are beautiful and are now in their 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, what a challenge it is for you all, the beautiful ones, to have to stand in judgment, being judged all the time mm. for what is, look at your face, right? You have a mirror. <laughs> yeah. Like, remember, Rosie, when you didn't work in TV, you did, like, big movies, and you got to work with amazing women in movies. But, like... As an actor on television, we and I would do like these episodic shows. Right. Every without fail, every season, two or three of the directors would come in and they would be like men who had been actors on TV shows in the eighties yes. or nineties who that then yes. transitioned well, Rosie, into yeah. being a director. And no like very few women. Yes. Early on, Rosie was a series regular on Give Me a Break, which was also like a little bit of a pivot because I remember you used to tell this story about how you were doing stand-up and you knew some executives from NBC were coming to watch you. Well, it's even better than that. It was Brandon Tarnikoff with Lorne Michaels and Cher. <gasps> oh, my God. Wow. And now, mind you, right, I'm a stand-up comic working at the Improv in, New in L.A., so... I knew they came to see Dana and I was friends with the waitresses at this tiny club called Igby's that's not open anymore. And I used to hang out there. It was sort of my home club. I loved it. It was small. I was friends with all the waitresses. So they held their checks because I was next. So they didn't drop the checks for, and so that they had to see me. So <laughs> I went on and so did awesome. my act. 
that and that's from, genius. From that, they called me in and they the Brandon Tarnikoff walked over with Lauren Michaels and said, "You're a very special talent. We're going to do something with you. Call my office in the morning." <gasps> so I called my sister and said, "I'm going to be on SNL." They were here for SNL. I'm going to be on SNL. I was convinced I was going to get to be on Saturday Night Live. But they said, no, you're going to be on the Nell Carter show. I was still thrilled <laughs> because she had been in Ain't Misbehaving, which I saw on Broadway. So oh, yeah. I was, you know, very excited to meet her. But she was in a very bad place when we were doing that. Mm. You know, she was really she, sick. She was really sick. And she had gone through some addiction issues and yeah. some custody issues and she was unhappy and it was very, very hard to be around. You know, yeah. she was. It's very- really weird, Rosie. You and I have so many weird things. My favorite Broadway soundtrack when I was a little kid. So like you were at the improv and I was a little kid and I had Ain't Misbehavin, the cassette tape, and I would listen to it over and over and over again. And I still sing at night sometimes to Cricket. I sing... Yeah, I don't stay out late, don't care to go. Like, right. I, it's so funny. Anyway, I love Nell Carter. R. Yeah, R. but she was, she was, you want to hear what she did the first day of my being on the set? Yes. yes. We're in the lunchroom and we're doing a reading of the script and the little boys, two little boys were like eight and five. Their mother comes in the room where we're all getting ready to eat our lunch and do our reading and she sees her and says, get that cunt out of my dress, um, out of this reading room, in front of the boys. Whoa. And uh, we did um, some jokes. We did the read through and the table thing was over and she was pissed off at the script. My first day on the set. Holy shit. Holy shit. And that was shit. my first big break, Busy. It was, it was my first break was to be on the show, you know? And I remember thinking, um, I, but Paul Sand was on the show, who was lovely. Mm-hmm. Rosetta Lenoir, who's um, who wrote Bublin Brown Sugar. Yes. You know that musical? And no, she actually, I need to. Yes. I need to know that though. Yeah, Bublin <laughs> Brown Sugar, and it was Rosetta Lenoir wrote this musical, and she was this classy old theater actress in New York, and I knew a lot about her. And she told me. She had um, polio as a kid and her father would put her up with the polio um, braces on the piano and give her the microphone and she would just sing in Harlem. Oh what a great story. Yeah, she, the, the people I have got to meet, you know, that's something that sometimes like is trippy to me. You know, I like sitting in my home with my kids at the pool, you know, trying to get Dakota to not be afraid of the cave. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's that's what my day entails. But then I think or I look on, you know, TV or I see a brilliant performance and I go, I know them. I think one of the things I really love, too, about the stories you're telling and the experiences that you've had is that I, in this industry, people will have like a good experience or a bad experience and internalize it and decide if I'm ever going to be a boss, I'm going to be like this. And you took the situations and the experiences that you had and you said this earlier and you came at everybody who worked for you with grace working for busy the same thing i worked i folded clothes i worked at a comedy theater i worked in a box office and let me tell you if you're an asshole to the people at the box office they're going to drop the check before you get on you know what i mean that's (laughs) right being being kind you being the type of person to go into a comedy club and knowing that those people deserve grace they drop the check for you and guess what everybody wins so i think that you have such longevity because you were a kind person yeah i think that you know you have to charles groden wrote a great book about this uh, you know it would be so nice if you weren't here is the name of it (laughs) (laughs) uh, it was just so spectacular about treating the janitor the same way as he Mm -hmm. treats the ceo which worked really well with janitors but not so much with ceos right yeah right and so he talked about his career and show business and and how we we forget, you know, I mean, when I was on the height of my show, like it was a very trippy experience. It wasn't like uh, anything r- close to real life. You know, you get mass adulation from the multitudes 
every day, like a shot mm-hmm. of heroin in your arm. You get people clapping for your very existence and then telling you how you changed and altered their life. And it's a lot to take in. Mm-hmm. And when I stepped away, I knew that this was all I could take. Right. How did you, but how, how did you deal with it? What was your coping mechanism? When I stopped? Yeah. Cause then all of a sudden it's like more or less kind of gone. You quit the yeah. heroin. You quit yeah. the heroin. So what's I your methadone? Did. Well, I started painting, mm-hmm. you know, I do very large paintings and um, my brother said we have them all in storage and nobody really wants them. And what do you <laughs> want to do with them? You know, I want like, one. Um, I would take one. You take <laughs> one? Wait, yeah. you better wait till you see it before you say that. <laughs> fair enough. Know. Fair enough. Painting, painting was the secret to detoxing. Sure, from- I think that from fame, from that high level of, you know, anything. Are you hungry? And you get seventeen options. You know, right? Or, yeah. They, you know, you want to taste this new ice cream? They just flew it in from uh, Hawaii for you. You know, <laughs> uh, what, it was like a, a never-ending smorgasbord in Vegas, you know? Yeah. Guys, at the Rosie O'Donnell show, one day Rosie said on the show that she liked Krispy Kreme donuts and we didn't just get Krispy Kreme donuts. We got the whole fucking machine that made the Krispy <laughs> Kreme donuts yeah. hot, like the hot donut conveyor oh, belt. Oh, that's so delicious. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, it just was- from her mentioning. Yeah. So, you know, that was a lot of, uh, and that, that drains on your soul, you know, mm-hmm. it pull, I mean, it pulls you away from your true path and essence and, you know, you can start to overlook things. I mean, well, yeah. my husband was saying this interesting thing because there has been, you know, a lot in the last year or so of these, like the idea of like a girl boss being canceled, you know, um, and some rightfully so. And for some of them, it's like, you read some of these things and he's like, you know, they always expect women in power to not just be the boss, but to also be the mom. Yeah. Also like be like deliver on the thing that like you are putting out there. But I think, I think you suffered from that a little bit too, Rosie. I think that, you know, I think that one of the things I always was surprised about is people would be like, Rosie's tough, you know, like she's a tough boss. And I was like, no, actually, like I've worked in a nursing home. I've worked in <laughs> retail. I've had tough bosses. She's direct and yeah. she's has a vision and she wants us to carry out this vision and she's right about the vision. So, you know, so it's really weird that you're painting that as tough because I always, I love instructions, you know, that I think you maybe, I don't know if you remember this about me. I love instructions. I love to be told this is how I want it. And then I'll bust my ass to make it how you want it. And so I always loved that you would be like directly, this is what I want, X, Y, Z. Can you do it? Great. Go do it. You know, so I never saw that as tough, but I think because you were a woman and I think whenever you, you know, you were, you were crowned the queen of nice. So whenever, (laughs) whenever the show was over and you took off the crown and had your sweatpants on and we were getting to work, people would, people who worked with us would be like, you know, oh, she's, she's not like smiling and laughing. And I'd be like, no, she's fucking doing business. She's working. Exactly. (laughs) She's doing business. Like we're all doing business. Ugh. Like we're all trying. We're, all trying. we're trying. We're trying. <laughs> Rosie, I know that you said that it was a weird experience to have people come to you in adulation and tell you that how you changed their lives. But um, you allow me to be one more person to say that I just want to tell a quick story and maybe we'll cut it out, but maybe we'll tell it. When I was first made a writer on your show... And I had come to your show as your assistant and I annoyed Rosie as an assistant and she like fired slash promoted me to a better job because (laughs) you said you were like, you're irritating to me. Your style of being an assistant is irritating to me, but I like you and I want you to stay here. (laughs) So I got another job. And then when a writing position opened, I was made a writer and I was, it was my dream come true. My dream come true came true when I was 23 years old. Like I didn't have any ambition beyond that to be a writer. And so I would go in to pitch every morning and my hands would shake and my voice would shake and you knew me a little bit already. And um, you asked our head writer, like, what, what's the deal with Casey? Like we know each other. 
why is she like shaking? Like she can barely speak. And so our head writer, Jeanette Barber was like, well, you know how like writers are on 13 week contracts. And you were like, no, I actually don't know. I don't t- explain to me what that is. And so she said, you know, everybody is only hired for 13 weeks at a time. And she's already a couple weeks in. And I'm sure like everyone, she's very nervous that in 11 weeks, this could all be over. And, you know, she's starting from square one. And you said to Jeanette, oh, okay, then do me a favor. Go to the show's lawyers, pick up her contract for two years, then go to her and tell her to relax and learn how to do this job. And that changed my life. You used your power to change my life. And I know that you did it for so many other people. Well, I love you, Casey. That's very, very sweet and touching of you to say. And, you know, we had a good thing there. I got to say, we had a really good thing. And I loved all the staff and I I was happy for the six years. The years that came after it were tough. You know, <laughs> They were tough to, to get my descent back to Earth. But that's where I want to be is, in you know, on Earth. And I still have a very privileged life and a very... Um, you know, I'm, I'm still reaping the benefits of that show financially. I will for the rest of my life. My children will. I, you know, I was very, very lucky timing. And it, it was like everything came together perfectly. You know, we were lucky too. Uh-huh. <laughs> we were lucky to get to watch it. <laughs> yeah. I was. <laughs> Rosie, thank you so much. Well, it's very fun to do anytime you want me. Oh. I mean, we're sell- I'm like, we're selling the real view, man. That's like, <laughs> that's it. Go sell it. I tell them I'm on board. Okay, yeah. I would you love it. You sell it. I'm on board. <laughs> I yeah. love it. Uh, guys, do you know that I had um horrible vision my entire life? Like, uh, I was like negative. 550 or 650 in one eye, like negative seven in the other. Yeah, like legally, like not, it was not good. Um, I always had to wear my glasses and and then I got surgery. And I have to tell you something that happened after I got that surgery. I weirdly missed wearing my glasses. Um, Also, I'm just a real sunglasses person because I have light blue eyes and I feel like they're very sensitive. You know, that one Mm -hmm. time I got snow blindness from the photo shoot that I did outside. (laughs) And I had to go to Cedars. That was scary. If I had been wearing sunglasses, maybe from Warby Parker, that probably wouldn't have happened. I love Warby Parker. I have loved Warby Parker for years. I remember when we were filming I Feel Pretty in Boston, going into the Warby Parker store and just having a field day. I remember going to the Warby Parker store in San Francisco when I was there for the comedy festival, having a field day. Now I'm not going into any stores, guys, because covid But you know what Warby Parker is doing? They have home try-on kits. You take a quiz, you order your home try-on, and then it comes. And here's the deal. Now, with all the time that we're spending in front of screens and the homeschooling with the girls and everything, got the whole family, the blue light filter lenses, um, which Warby Parker now has available. And it's perfect if you're concerned about the effects of blue light um, and you know, you can just, you just add it to your order during the checkout. And I like the aesthetic of Warby Parker. Like still my favorite sunglasses are from years ago. You can't even get them anymore. And the best part is that I have brought them back to Warby Parker multiple times and they've just put new lenses in them for me. Um, they're these light pink frames. They're really cute. Um, you guys should try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. Order five pairs of glasses to try at home for free for five days. And there's no obligation to buy if you're like, these all are not my style and I don't want them. That's not a big deal. It ships free and it includes a prepaid return shipping label. And I just like, I got to tell you, I just love, I just love Warby Parker. I really do. All their frames are cute. Their frames are all cute. Everybody's I love that they're kind of like... Everybody's face isn't always made for certain glasses, but uh, every pair that I've tried on from there has been great. And maybe I just have a great face, but I'm going to go with the glasses are good. <laughs> they have they have really good glasses. And um, yeah, I also, I like kind of, I feel like I met the guy that started Warby Parker and I really liked him. 
he was really nice. You know what's re- you know what's really cool for every mm. pair of glasses that Warby Parker sells, they distribute a pair of glasses to someone in need. Right, <gasps> that's that is true. I love a one for one program, guys. I'm very excited for you to do this. Just because you're stuck at home doesn't mean that you shouldn't get some new cool frames for the fall. And I love you, Warby Parker, and I love you guys. Try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash our best. No obligation to buy. Warbyparker.com slash our best. Do it. Do it up. Oh, I loved that. I loved talking to her. I loved the goss. She gave us some old hot goss. Yes. I love old hot goss. I love That it. was a thing we loved on Busy Tonight. We loved old hot goss. Like gossip, you know, that no one particularly cares about at this point, but we do. We want to <laughs> hear could, it. You get to see the ripple effect. You could be like, oh, that happened I want in that- 1993. <laughs> I want well. that Nell Carter goss. <laughs> I want yeah. that, like, I want to know who she called a cunt. Like I want to. I want to know everything. Absolutely. Anyway, Rosie, I adore you. I look forward to talking to you many, many, many more times in my life. Now we're friends. <laughs> now she's my friend. That's right. Group chat, baby. Uh, group, oh my God! Yes, put her on a group chat. Okay, <laughs> guys, we've got. We've been getting some of your letters. I'm super excited some advice, some people who had some ideas, some people who just want to say hi. And now you're going to be emailing us if you'd like to be put on a safe space group thread. If Dan from Chicago is listening and wants to be put on a group thread so that he doesn't feel the need to tell the world that Chrissy Teigen's eggs don't taste good, find another place to get your group thread. Um, (laughs) Just kidding, Dan. I would put you on a group thread with someone. Uh, Just found me. Um, Okay. We got this letter and I I have feelings. Okay. So, hi, Busy, Casey, and Chantira. I am struggling with uh, myself lately in knowing the right way to be true to my purpose. Mm -hmm. Oh, snap. I hear it. I'm an interior designer in the high-end sphere. I'm good at my job. I could do that thing we women do and be falsely modest, but it doesn't seem to be the place for it. It's not, girl. Just tell us how good you are. She's great at what she does. She loves her coworkers and a lot of the aspects. But if I'm being honest with myself, I really struggle with the idea that I'm helping rich folks make their homes pretty when so many people in the world and our country in particular are fighting for basic human rights. My undergraduate degree was in poli sci, had dabbled with the idea of a career in policy work or something social science related before I changed tracks to pursue interior design 12 years ago. I've been trying to fill that gap with my work on my own time, writing, calling representatives, speaking out on my own life against injustices, donating money to righteous causes and helping to bring a more philanthropic bent to my company. It just doesn't feel like enough. At the end of the day, most of my clients are wealthy and white. And is that really who I want to dedicate most of my life to helping? I like my job. I love my coworkers, but I feel like I'm not fulfilling any greater purpose for the world. How do you know when it's time to pivot and what to pivot to? How do you work up the courage to leave a good situation in pursuit of fulfillment or purpose as amorphous as that is? Thank you for any advice you may have, Em. Well, Em, let me tell you something. You just made the first step. It is time to pivot. My friend. I, no? I, I don't Anyone know. else? I, this is what I'll say, okay? This is just me, right? Mm-hmm. I, uh, before I got my first writing job in comedy, I was living in Chicago, and I sincerely looked into running for office in Chicago, starting small and then getting bigger. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I decided that I was like, if I get a job writing in the industry... Uh, I won't go into politics. But if I do not get a job within a year, I will de- de- dedicate myself solely to uh, like policy change. And, and what I ended up getting a job. And for me, what I've learned uh, is that um, everybody plays a role and you don't necessarily have to stay in one lane. But this is what I'll say. She has access to influential people and lots of money. Her perspective is important because uh, they might not ever, ever talk to anyone, let alone let someone in their homes with the perspective that she has. Also, she makes good money. I make good money being a television writer and I have a stupid blue check mark. And if I tell people to donate something, I can get $10,000 donated to a thing as opposed to 
if I <laughs> didn't have a blue check mark. Also, yeah. in this, I, the money that I make, mm-hmm. I try to give more than if I if I didn't work in the industry. So I think that like it's hard to find a balance. But like if you really think you're good at what you're doing, you probably make bank and can help and be very influential in those circles. But also, if you want to go do something else, it's never too late. That's I just feel my like I just feel like what I'm hearing from this letter is that she ultimately is like, this is a moment right now. And she's right. Like, this is a moment Mm -hmm. right now where I think that if you feel like you want to participate more, you should do it. You should take the leap. Because, you know, the truth is, you're right. Yes, Shantara, you're right. But I'm going to kind of... I'm just gonna. I'm gonna make a lot of assumptions based on this yeah. letter because we don't have we don't have a t- all of the information. I'm gonna assume she's white. Yeah, this woman, and I'm gonna assume that, and I'm going to assume that she already like it, you know ha- like comes from kind of a place of privilege, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. So, so that having access to that and like being in those spaces won't change, you know. But if she's feeling like a pull to fulfill a greater purpose in her own life, I think that that is, this is the moment right now where it's worth leaning into what that is. And I would just say that, and making changes on that level is like where we're going to start to see some real changes in our own communities. So I would say possibly to go to like run for something or, is you know, or Emily's list yeah. and and like see what kind of help or guidance you could get from them like just do like a little fact finding absolutely I think that honoring the part of yourself that's like I'm not fulfilling a greater purpose for the world maybe because it sounds like she works at a firm right yeah. like a design firm with yeah. other people maybe coming up with your own plan of a philanthropic arm for the company maybe that's a thing that your company can do and you can spearhead and that can be your contribution you know I was I was gonna say it sounds to me like M really loves what she does but also she said the phrase it's it's never like doing what I do to help other people is never enough I think the first thing you have to acknowledge is that it's never gonna be enough we were yeah. talking about it early um, we were talking about this earlier Right now, there there are so many needs to be addressed in the world, and each individual person can only do so much. And it's also still okay to enjoy what you do. Um, it's okay to be successful at what you do. So I feel like maybe it sounds like you're not ready to make an entire pivot, but maybe you're ready to make like sort of a philosophical pivot and uh, a shift in your priorities. Sort of like Busy was saying, like maybe you can volunteer with Habitat for Humanity. Yeah, which by the way, was like the greatest week of my life when we went, when I got this like group of friends together 13 months after Hurricane Katrina and we went and volunteered at Musicians Village um, and it was truly the greatest week of my life I think for me too like I I really believe that um right now so many white women especially are really feeling feeling that pull to like pivot into this uh like social justice and the the political sphere but I, I will say this there are people already doing that work hard they're doing it and they've been doing it for a long time and so this is for everybody who wants to be more politically involved i would say before you even go sign up go talk to the women in your community that have been doing it for 10 or 12 years and they will tell you not like what what's the internet needed. said. They right. will tell you exactly what's needed. And I mm-hmm. bet you 100% the thing that you thought was um, the road away from what you wanted is exactly what they are missing in something that has already been built from the ground up. And yeah. you will be so, so happy that you have 12 years of interior design experience with major corporations and big money because a lot of these places are doing the work but they don't have the clout 
You know what I mean? Even if you go to something and you've never done it before, you could be like, I work for this firm. And you can give credibility credibility to someone who has been doing the work. So right. I would I yeah. would say like for me, I think that no matter what you do, like follow your heart, obviously, but don't ever for a second think that there aren't people on the ground doing the work that you want to help with. Uh, I would find those people in the community and see where you are needed. And if there is a gap, go fucking fill it. Yeah. Because and I, that's, I, think no, great. Yeah. I think we can all, we can all identify really strongly with what you're saying because, you yeah. know, Shantira and I are comedy writers. Busy has been an actor and there have been, I guarantee all three of us have felt a million times like, oh, what we do is kind of useless and stupid and not important. A, that's not really true. I think it brings people joy and I think that it brings people togetherness. So whatever. But when you're feeling like that, there have also been times when I've had someone reach out to me from Emily's List and say, hey, we need a TV writer to come help us think of like this campaign that we want to do. Can you do it? And so it feels so good to have someone turn to you and say, actually, your talent would come in a really handy for us right now. Will you do it? It's such a good feeling to be confident in your abilities and your talents and doing something. And then to have somebody who's been doing the work all along say, this is how we could use you. You also have to like, remember to keep, keep that, yeah. that everybody works better if you're like, if you, th this is like a thing from De DeRay McKesson's book, right? But like everybody works better if they're, if you can think of yourself as like being in a chorus, you know? And if you're just joining the chorus and you're like, I'm really a tenor. And they're like, we are full of tenors. But if you could go over there for one second, <laughs> learn the alto part, we will get to you. No, I don't know. No, don't that, know that is perfect. But you know what I mean? I think that's the thing too that I've learned is that like, I also talked to my therapist about this is that, Everyone has a role. And even if you want to be a tenor, if you are about the work, you will be an alto until a tenor space opens up. <laughs> because right. we're all in this chorus together. I just watched mm -hmm. Sister Act 2 and we are trying to win Allstate. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's such a Guys, trap are, that... And, and there are so many metaphors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's such a trap that we fall into because I think that in our careers, we're taught to like rise and rise and, and to try to climb to the top. But when you're trying to do volunteer work or helpful work, that's really not the goal. It's not the goal to rise to the top of a volunteer organization. It's to do the work that actually helps people. Correct. And here's the other thing I want to say, because we all know I'm such a credit bitch. Being in an activist space and working with organizations for the last decade, I have really come to realize that credit is not where it's at. <laughs> yeah. in this in, when we're talking about this and that's also like that brings me to the Rosie you know back to back to our convo with Rosie um, you know you were like it was one tenth of what you were actually doing and I put a lot of my shit out on Instagram because I want people to like donate and I want to help elevate different organizations it's and important. platforms and like that is part of how I use my white privilege in my platform but I also do a lot of fucking shit that I don't talk about that I don't need to talk about because I don't need like any kind of like pat on the back for just participating in my in the world as like a decent fucking human do you yeah. know what I mean yeah if you're doing uh, it for a, if you're doing it for a cookie just yeah just make a Don't, cookie. Just make a cookie because, <laughs> because, because honestly, because honestly, it's like, and you're, and you'll never get what you no, think you, you will want. not get the cookie yeah, you want. You won't get the, you cookie, you get the want. cookie you want. You will get an oatmeal raisin. Golden raisin. And what raisin. you want oh. is a gluten free chocolate chip <laughs> and the just size make, of your head. Make your own cookie. Guys, good. I feel like we had a lot of lessons in here today. And I, it was we really just, good. I, you for know, my spirit. Me too. I, and I am not lying. When I started, I mean, I didn't even know if I was going to make it through the opening without crying because I have had a really rough week. Oh, no, this is where I cry. Um, but I feel really good. And I'm glad that you guys are here with me. And I love you. And um, we love you, too. We love thanks. you. This That's is really a good nice. group chat. <laughs> this is, guys, can I say something? Don't tell the others. This is my favorite group chat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to try to go eat like some salad. Thanks for not doing <laughs> it on the podcast. 
Casey got so mad at me. <laughs> also, I didn't give you the toe update. I went to the doc- the podiatrist. Oh yeah, I'm always invested in the toe the toenail that fell off. I got I'm like really invested. <laughs> I got okay, Casey, turn your headphones off for one second so I can tell you <laughs> really fast, and then we'll go. <sighs> I got he lasered it. Uh-huh. My toes. He's like, oh yeah. yeah, you've got like an infection, but it's not it's not super bad. Yeah, I have to go four times six to get weeks apart. Laser on the toes. It did not feel great. I'm like, I gotta look this up because I like really want to see a laser on a toe. You can come with me next time. Wear a mask. You have to sign a thing. Come with me in six okay. weeks. Okay. Okay, Casey, we're done with the toes. We're done. Thank you. The good news is hopefully by next summer, hopefully by next summer, my toes will be beautiful again. <laughs> um, all right, guys, listen, it was all a lot. We got, we had other letters that we didn't get to. I feel like we talked too much. Well, I was just going to say, uh, we'll be back next Wednesday. Email us your questions about pivots, busy doing her best at gmail.com. Also your million dollar ideas that you never executed that then someone else came up with and made a million dollars. Follow us on Instagram at BP is doing her best. We only have one picture posted and uh, like 200 followers. So follow us there if you want to keep up with the podcast. And um, do you want to say bye to everybody busy? You guys, I love you so much. Thank you for all the kind words. If you have something really nasty to say, take it to the group text. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and I'll see you next week. We or, love you. No, well, you'll hear you. I'll hear you'll hear you'll hear me next week. Okay. Well, <laughs> that was my best, guys. <laughs> <laughs>